Welcome to History Hack. If you didn't know by now, we are the revolution. That means we're sharp, witty, lots of fun, but it also means that we're essentially the peasants in Les Mis huddled round a table in the corner of the bar with no money. If you enjoy the show, please do support us. We have a Patreon account by which you can donate a small monthly sum in appreciation of what you're hearing. Alternatively, we have Ko-fi in which you can just do a one-off donation as a thank you if you particularly enjoy a certain episode. Either way, we massively appreciate all of your support. Hope you enjoy the show. Hello, welcome to another episode of History Hack. I'm excited, I'm always excited. It's Ancient History Day today and I've got lovely Beth with me. Beth, who have we got on today? Hi Alina, today we have Alexandra Stills with us. Alexandra is a classical historian who specialises in sports and public spectacles in the ancient Mediterranean states. Hi Alexandra, thanks for joining us. Hello, thank you for having me. I'm really excited because we're doing something really fun today and something that everybody thinks is Roman, but it's not necessarily all Roman, is it? It's not all about the Romans. No, we've got the the fun gladiators today. Oh, I don't know. Oh, I don't know. Some people might be critical of that. You've got to prove to us now that this is the fun one. Challenge accepted. Done. Okay, let's kick off. So we're talking about gladiators. Yay! Uh, <laughs> all the waving going on in the room right now. Woohoo! So, <sighs> gladiators. Predominantly people think of the film of which you and I have already had a long conversation about that previously. <laughs> so ignoring yeah. the film, ignoring Spartacus, don't hate me. I love that TV series. Don't judge me. Don't worry. Oh, I love thank it. God. Okay, thank God. So we're on the same page here. What oh, yeah. do you know about the idea of gladiators in the West of Europe? So the truth about gladiators in the West is that it was very much a kind of ideological thing for the Romans. It wasn't just, you know, the crowds are bloodthirsty, so let's give them some guts and gore. There's a definite purpose to gladiators in the West, and it started off as a kind of funeral sacrifice thing. And then from about Julius Caesar onwards, and Augustus really bedded it in, it turned into kind of this tool for the Romans to think about themselves via watching these men fight. So it taught them the virtues of courage and militarism and imperialism. So all of these different kinds of things. So it's it's not just some really muscly boys clanging metal sticks against each other. It's kind of an ideology by stealth. So you go to the amphitheatre and you learn all about what it is to be a Roman man. And it is about being a Roman man because the women were, you know, stuck up at the back. They could barely see saw the men at the front and it, it was a lesson and I think it's, if you think about it like war movies today you go into the cinema you watch the movie and you think oh yeah could I do that yeah I, I could definitely do that I could be a hero and that's that's essentially what it was in the west at least. I've got another question do you think that's what masculinity was predominantly about in that time period is all about being the macho it's hero kind of very trying to find the right word here very male you know what I mean yeah I think looking at a lot of ancient civilizations warfare is always constantly on their minds um, and Rome it expanded very quickly and when they were you know sending out farmers would spend the season at war invading all these other people and they, they'd get you know farmers and other kind of carpenters that kind of thing just shove some weapons in their hands and say okay you're in the army for the summer that didn't do very well um they certainly got their asses handed to them several times uh, against some of the foes particularly the carthaginians for instance and it's only really when they start having soldiers professional soldiers that they turn into this real military machine so yeah it's absolutely something that they were thinking about constantly is how to be the macho military conquerors of the world so courage and militarism were absolutely things that they were thinking about a lot of the time even at the height of the empire they're surrounded by other uh, civilizations and, and tribes that 
they either want to conquer or they're constantly threatening or are threatening them. So even when the empire is enormous, they're always thinking, how can we be the strongest? And gladiators were a way of thinking about that, you know. Absolutely. So thinking about the east of Europe, were there many distinctions between the idea of the gladiator there in comparison to the west? Yeah, and this is the interesting thing about it, because as I said, you know, it's an ideological thing in the west. And part of that is how to be an imperialist power. So early types of gladiators, because you have different types of heavy fighters, light fighters, and they were sorted into types that were named after and dressed in kind of armour that evoked uh, historical enemies, such as Samnites and Thracians. So the, the Romans would watch ancient enemies fight each other And they were controlling that narrative as Romans. So it was a kind of reminder, oh, yeah, we're still controlling them even long after we've conquered them. And that's a way to think about being an imperialist power. But that doesn't really work out in the provinces where you're under an imperialist power. So we have gladiators in the entire empire. But in Greece, they treat them completely differently They're not really thinking about um, the ideology that way. They're just in it for the fun. And that really shines through uh, in the way they write about themselves. So, for instance, in the West, uh, stage names might be Flame or, or Sharp or Strong. But in the East, they chose stage names based on the myths that they grew up with from the Iliad and the Odyssey all of these myths that they were taught as children, that's where they were choosing their stage names from. So you could go and see a play in the theatre which would have a battle between two mythical characters. And then a couple of days later, you could go back to the same theatre and see that fight with people with the same names, uh, Polynices, Ategles, actually fighting each other for real. So in a way, it's kind of taking the stories that they grew up with and turning it into a live show. So less about ideology and more about kind of emphasising their culture whilst they're underneath the the yoke of of another civilization. I actually really like that ideology of having, I don't know, should I say two gods fighting it out on stage and then going, you know what, I'm actually going to go see that for real. That kind of sounds really, really fun that you see the play, which we all love a play, and then actually yeah. see them bad. I mean, my next question here is, did they actually kill each other in Greece? Was it a fight yes. to death? Well, this is, about, this is a bit of a myth for the East and the West, is that it was always a fight to the death. And the reason that that can't be true for both halves of the empire is that gladiators were an investment. They were incredibly expensive. Uh, for the owner of the school and he would buy enslaved people or someone might lease themselves to him if they needed to make a quick buck and the idea was that they would make money per fight to recoup that investment so if your gladiators are if if every single fight someone has to die you're never going to recoup that investment, particularly if you spent a long time training them and feeding them and housing them. So the owners of the gladiators would lease out their gladiators to whoever was putting on the show. And it's it's rare that the person putting on the show would be the person also owning them. So you most likely go to someone and say, look, I need 10 people for my games. Can you provide them? Here's the money. If your gladiator survived, and they won, you would retain the winnings. And you could put that towards uh, paying them or towards their freedom or for pure profit if you wanted to. But if that gladiator died, the person who had leased him from you had to pay you his full worth. So actually, if you had a set of games where all of the gladiators were dying in huge numbers, the person putting on that games would be bankrupt. Because particularly the gladiators that everyone wanted to see were the celebrities, you know, the ones that had gained a following, uh, really great technique. And you only get that through experience. So if your 
wanting a decent show, you're going to hire the best of the best. They're very expensive. And if they die, you've, you've suddenly got a very empty wallet. In Greece, we can see that they did die. You know, there's got to be some level of risk. And quite often it's, it's the, the beginners are more likely to die. But dying definitely wasn't the aim. The, the point of gladiators wasn't to see someone die necessarily, although that was part of it. How do you face death with courage? That was another lesson that they were supposed to be teaching me. But the main thing was technique and skill. That's what the Romans really, really love to see. So if you're hiring the best of the best, you didn't want to spend a fortune, you wouldn't send them out on a, a fight with no mercy which was how they termed it, you'd send them out with the first to tap out, like in wrestling, for instance, that's the loser. So yeah, it's absolutely, you, there was no need for them to die. At different points of, of the empire, you either had maybe a one in 10 chance of dying. So you're also pretty good if, if, you, if you were talented, pretty, pretty good. And you wanted them to have that experience so that they could build up that celebrity following so that you could have more people coming to the show. No, that's so interesting to hear about the almost celebrity gladiators and, and the following and how important it was, as you said, you know, for them to gain experience. Do you have, off the top of your head, do you have any any examples of, of those gladiators who've come across stories about particular gladiators and who resonated and had a following? Yeah, actually, there's quite a few. Um, and this is where the, the gravestones come in really helpful, because in the West, the gravestones are quite boring. They'll have the stage name, a number, which is just how many fights they had or how many fights they won and what type of gladiator they were. But in Greece, they start getting really imaginative with how they talk about themselves in their gravestones and they give more biographical details. So, for instance, there's one gladiator. He's a retiarius, which means he fights with a trident and a net. His name is Melanippos, and he died in Alexandri Alexandria Troas, and we have his gravestone. And the way he says it is he fought 13 times and won 12, which is a huge, hugely successful career. And the way he says it is Heracles completed 12 labours. Heracles, the greatest hero of Greek mythology, completed 12 labours. Well, I matched him, actually. It was just on the 13th that I died. But you've also got other gladiators that are talking about winning up to 50 fights. So their careers would have been incredibly long, especially when you consider that uh, there wouldn't have been games on every single day. This was maybe a couple of year. So, yeah, you could have an incredibly long career and be very well known. There's one, um, there's one gladiator who managed to survive long enough to earn his freedom and he became a gladiator trainer. And he put on so many games successfully that he's got a freedom of the city kind of thing for about five Greek cities. And his gravestone is just a list of, I put on all these games and here's all the cities that gave me honours. Aren't I incredible? And, you know, some of them go on for ages because their careers are so long. So, yeah, you could, you could absolutely be a huge celebrity star in a different way to the West. Were there many amphitheatres? Amphitheatres, Jesus Christ. <laughs> Were there many amphitheatres? Oh, I can't say the fucking word. It's, it's a really difficult word. So. <laughs> amphitheatres, right. Were there many amphitheatres around Greece? Because you know that in Rome, God, every city had one, probably every bloody town had one. They were everywhere. Was it the same for Greece? No, it wasn't. And you're absolutely right. If you look at a map of amphitheatres, the whole of the Italian peninsula is just covered with them. And then when you get to Spain and to France, they've got a load. Britain uh, has got more amphitheatres than the whole of Greece and Turkey combined. You know, we've, we've got a, a lot here. Uh, a lot of them were attached to Roman military, so they're usually by a fort. But in Greece, there, there aren't that many. The earliest two are fairly early in the development of the amphitheatre. You've got to remember that Rome, uh, the Colosseum wasn't built and finished until 80 CE. 
So that's quite late. Rome had a couple of very early amphitheatres, but they were temporary, they were quite small. The earliest Western amphitheatre is actually Pompeii from 70 BCE. So that's, you know, Republican. Republican amphitheatres don't really leave the Italian peninsula um, much at all, apart from a couple in Greece. And we think that they were both built by Julius Caesar. So in a couple of years before his assassination, he was going on on all of these tours of different areas. And he invested a lot of money in Antioch, which is in Turkey, and in Corinth, which is in the Peloponnese. Uh, Corinth had been razed to the ground decades before by another Roman general. And uh, Julius Caesar was reviving the city. So he invested a load in a lot of different buildings. And in both of those cities, what he did was build quite basic, admittedly, uh, amphitheatres. And that's because he was hoping to pump in a load of uh, Roman people to move there, to invest in the area. And if you were wanting Roman people to move there and build a life there, then they had to have the creature comforts that they were used to in Rome. And this is around the same time that gladiators have started to become a really big thing. The Roman army was using gladiators to help train recruits. So if you had a city with Roman people moving in and a military presence, something like an amphitheatre was definitely something that you would want. So you see Julius Caesar, and he's, a, he's an earlier, he's an early adapter of, of games in the West as well. He's really pushing it for it to turn into something that's not just something that you see at funerals. So he builds those two over in the East. At around the same time, Mark Antony, he had a gladiator school uh, in Turkey. He didn't build an amphitheatre. You don't really see amphitheatres again until the real height of gladiators in the East, which is the second and third centuries. There, there's a couple, and the ones that there are, like Pergamum, they're really big, but they're not common. And I think that's because not only, I mean, they're huge, right? Amphitheatres in general are quite massive. You look at the Colosseum, it's it's incredible. And some of the ones in provinces, such as uh, some of the ones in Tunisia, are enormous. But you need a lot of ground space for them to go on. Their footprint is quite large. The amount of uh, man hours needed to build one, the amount of raw materials to build one, it's a considerable investment. But I'm not sure that the Greeks didn't build them for that reason, because let's not forget, Asia Minor in particular is, is loaded in this period. It's, it's not a poor province at all. What I think it is, is that the Greeks were immensely proud of their cultural heritage. And they wanted to retain as much of that as possible under occupation. So they're not in a rush to build these massive, stereotypically Roman buildings. It's a very uniquely Roman invention. So what they do instead is they decide, OK, we'll take the fights because that's the bit that we like but we're gonna keep it in buildings that we invented, that we like, that we've been using for centuries. So instead, you see gladiator shows are put on in stadiums and theatres, but you don't actually need much of a venue at all, depending on the size of the show that you're gonna put on. So you could put up some wooden bleacher style seating anywhere that you've got a flat space either a grassy plain or maybe a paved area. If you put up some seating and maybe some balconies around the surrounding buildings, you can have that knocked up in about a week to put your show on. And we know that they did this, uh, for instance, on the holy island of Delos. They put on shows in one of the forums on Delos, the Forum of the Italians, and we can see where they've put the benches. So instead of building all of these massive Roman buildings, they're using existing spaces and adapting them as necessary. So instead of building these massive, you know, very uniquely Roman buildings, they're choosing to use existing spaces and maybe making a couple of little adaptations, but nothing too major. So it's taking a Roman event and situating it in a very Greek space, which is what they want. So instead of having large amphitheatres, they ended up maybe sometimes doing things in slightly smaller spaces or very much smaller spaces. 
So would they put on more events rather than less? This is what we don't know as much. We've got a few uh, texts that say we put on a show and this is what we had in it. And we know that they did put on the same kinds of things as the Colosseum, the beast hunts and gladiators. We don't know whether they would be on the same day, whether it would take a whole day. So we know that they're, they're taking the events and putting them in the calendar somehow. What they were for was as a, a gift to the population on behalf of the emperor from the priests of the imperial cult. So some of those would be a small one day event and some of them would, would be a lot bigger and may contain different types of entertainment, but we don't know that much about it, unfortunately. We talked before about some of the stage names that the gladiators would choose. And you, you spoke about that distinction between um, the Romans with the very kind of martial names that they picked and then the Greeks looking to incorporate more of the, the myths um, into their names. Do you have any favourite names that you've come across? I think one of my favourite ones is Hermes. And we've got a couple called Hermes. And I think the reason is, is because... The way we think about Hermes, he's, he's kind of quite cute, isn't he? He's, he's got those winged sandals and he's buzzing around everywhere, delivering mail. But one of the jobs that perhaps isn't as famous anymore, Hermes' job was as a psychopomp. So he would uh, take people down to the underworld. He would deliver the dead to Hades. So he's got the name Hermes automatically tells you I'm Hermes, I'm going to be taking you to Hades today, prepare to die. So I kind of think that's a, a cool name for a gladiator to have. But all of these names that are coming from the Iliad, for instance, the Iliad is all about war, right? And it's got loads of different uh, battles that are really quite memorable after you've read them because they're described in such detail. So, for instance, Achilles, I think there's five uh, that we know of called Achilles. Uh, Ajax, Alexandros, which is uh, the same as Paris. Uh, I think there's one called Hector. So you've got all of these names. It would be the same as uh, if modern wrestlers and boxers today went out um, calling themselves the favourite names of heroes from movies and comic books. So if you were to go to WWE wrestling and you could see Superman fighting Batman, that's the kind of thing it would be. You have that kind of association with the stuff that you learned from childhood and you know that they've been in all these battles. Now you're seeing it live on screen. So it's that kind of excitement. So it's, it's really cool choosing these names from, you know, storybooks that you've grown up with. I love the way you made that comparison. I could just imagine people listening in oh my god that'd be so cool batman and, and superman but then you see that sometimes in tv where you've got uh godzilla versus is it the predator oh yeah probably <laughs> yeah and it's, it's the same kind of thing everyone's got like their favorite story their favorite comic book their favorite superhero right it's the same thing everyone would have read the iliad and, and other epic poems like it and they'll have their favorite favorite character and all of a sudden they see their favorite character being brought to life before them and it's very important to notice that the difference because when those mythical stories were told in greek plays all of the fighting happened off stage so you'd have them you know hyping themselves up for this big battle and then they'd go off into the wings and you'd get the messenger character come on and say oh yeah well this guy won and that guy's dead now because not <laughs> They didn't show the violence. I mean, it would have been quite difficult to show the violence, I think, especially with the limited special effects. But you didn't see it. Kind of blue balls. You didn't see what you came there to see. But with gladiators, you saw everything. And again, when you read the Iliad, it's really specific with how these people died. You know, you, you talk about people getting spears through their throat so it cuts their tongue off at the stem and uh, being pierced just under the left nipple. And it's all really specific and really graphic. And you don't really get that performed 
until the Greeks discover gladiators. No, I absolutely love that. I mean, me and Alina have just been kind of laughing in the background at this, just amazing stage names. I need a period drama. I haven't actually watched <laughs> many ancient ones, but I need a period drama where we have the gladiators and someone strolls on be like, I'm Hermes, I'm going to take you to Hades. Like, <laughs> I, need, I need this now. It needs to happen. <laughs> yeah, um, I mean, can you imagine they're like talking to the crowd? You can imagine them kind of like with these catchphrases almost. Yes amazing it would be so good <laughs> and thinking about other kind of ways of physicality as well as the fighting what kind of sports were common in Greece at this time for men including combat sports but also just other kind of recreation so the Greeks for a long time had been obsessed with exercise uh, because it led to a beautiful body but also it led to military strength and again the Greeks were constantly thinking about war it's not something that they particularly enjoyed but they were too argumentative to avoid it. So uh, they had to bring themselves up to a, a decent physical standard so that at any given time they were ready to ready to go. And this is what we see with the Olympic Games is stuff that you were preparing for. So the running would be useful. And they had a race, for instance, in the Olympics where you had to race in full armour so that people could, you know, get used to moving around in it. And we also see in the Olympic Games and in other athletic festivals across the entire Greek world, and they were pretty much everywhere. You've, you've got a famous one, such as the Olympic Games, the ones at Delphi, but nearly every single city would have a set of games. Um, maybe not pan-Hellenic, but they would be quite large. And in every single city, therefore, you would find wrestlers and boxers. And there's one combat sport called Pankration that was incredibly popular, where there were barely any rules at all. So you couldn't gouge out people's eyes, and I think it was no biting. And that was, you know, pretty much it. <laughs> and these had been going for centuries before the Romans even thought about popping over to Greece. And in wrestling, you would frequently get broken bones. In boxing, that was incredibly bloody. There's uh, one story from Nemea in the Nemean Games. There was a boxer who cheated slightly. You're not supposed to use uh, an open fist. It has to be a closed fist, but he used open. And he'd punched so hard into this guy's abdomen, he ended up puncturing into the torso and pulling out, a <laughs> you know, he eviscerated him just with his hand. Uh, this was really, you know, a really famous story across Greece about this this uh, boxer who'd managed to eviscerate his opponent. And you, there's lots of stories about these combat athletes dying. Uh, for instance, there was, there was one who was in a chokehold and he was suffocating. And his trainer yelled out to him, do you want to die a loser? Or do you want to die a winner, an Olympic victor? And the guy thinks about it and says, OK, I'm clearly going to die anyway. I might as well go out winning. So he sweeps the leg of the other guy. I think he ended up breaking his ankle and does some kind of move. So they both end up dying. <laughs> you know, this this prize match at the Olympics, they both end up dying. But because he was the last one to make a move, he won. And that was what was most important to them. It was better to die a winner than to perhaps survive as the loser. That's how important they found these kinds of combat sports. So the Greeks were absolutely used to reading about and seeing violence. They just hadn't really thought of a way yet to combine it with their other passion of the myths and the dramatic stories. And that's where the Romans came in with this beautiful blend that they thought, oh yeah, it, it, it covers all of our bases. And they're half naked as well, so we like that too. You know, it's everything that the Greeks loved, competition, muscles, combat sports, and, and a, a touch of drama in there as well. It covers all of their bases. It ticks every single box that they have. So we all like those uh, nicely chiselled <laughs> Greek and Roman athletes. But this 
look, you bought this idea already, which is the body beautiful idea. Does how important is I mean you were so you already touched on this, but I want you to expand a little bit more on it of this interest and the ideas of masculinity. Yeah, sure. So for instance, at the Olympics and other Greek athletic festivals, they would compete nude. And I mean completely nude. So <laughs> I mean if you're watching them running along, I can only imagine, you know, bouncing. But um they were, they were competing absolutely nude. Nothing was hidden uh, to avoid cheating, for instance. You can't cheat if and pull out something that's hidden in your loincloth, for instance. So the Greeks were used to seeing nudity and they absolutely loved it. Um, if you look at statues, a lot of them are idealised, but they show exactly what they wanted in a male body and it is highly muscled. Not like really uh, bulging like perhaps uh, you see in bodybuilders today, more kind of slim line, but incredibly defined. So yeah, the Greeks, they loved the idea of a nude body. And the thing is, is with armour, if you're a Roman soldier, for instance, most of your torso is covered. You don't get that kind of same uh, level of muscle on show. But gladiators actually don't wear a lot of armour. And I think this is one of the reasons the Greeks like it, is because you can see what you want to see. The Greeks didn't have um, the same kind of armour as the Romans. So even if the Romans had come over with gladiators wearing Roman armour, it would have been quite foreign. But what we do see is kind of nearly nude gladiators. So gladiators across the entire empire would wear the same kind of thing. So it doesn't matter where you are, you can see a gladiator fight and it will look like what it does in your hometown. So the same sets of armour on the same types of gladiators with the same rules. And the armour for nearly every single type of gladiator is fairly minimal. So you might have leg guards and depending on whether you're a light lightweight gladiator with a small shield, those leg guards would come up to maybe mid-thigh. If you're carrying one of the large shields, they'll only come up to your knee. Then, depending on the type of gladiator you are, you might have one arm covered in kind of a, a wrapping, or you might have a kind of shoulder guard, and you might have something around your wrists, not often, depending on what gladiator you are. But your torso would be almost completely bare, unlike a soldier. And the, the point of that is, again, it's not just so that everyone can, you know, cop an eyeful, even though that's you know, one of the benefits. It's all to do with coming back to what they were watching it for, right? Which isn't just to see blood spurting. It's not like in the movies where, you know, they're just yelling, kill, kill, kill. What they want to see is a well-matched fight, which will last anything up to about 15, 20 minutes. So you have to have good stamina as well. They wanted to watch a well-matched fight with two talented fighters so that they could talk about techniques and skill. So that's the reason why these gladiators barely went wearing anything. It's so that they can start using their shield in a defensive manner, which is all part of the, the skill set that they're showing off is, can you block these blows? Can you use the shield offensively, maybe? So it's, again, it's not like movies where it's just metal clanging, swords clanging. Part of the skill of being a gladiator was to defend your naked torso whilst also being offensive, which is incredibly difficult. It takes a lot of skill to do that. There's a reason why people go into battle you know, with massive metal jackets on, right? So there's there's a twofold reason why gladiators are nude. In Rome, it's just for the skill. In Greece, I'm sure it's it's because they appreciated the physique as well. And again, we see this in the tombstones because in the West, there's not a lot of tombstones with it with reliefs on with images. It's much more popular in in Greece to have your gorgeous body in its gladiator uniform on your tombstone and they were showing off their, their physiques there as well 
So was this a Romanization or was it Greece assimilating a cultural import? So yeah, this is a really interesting question. Who is making the Greeks do this? And um, traditionally, the idea has been that this was a form of Romanization. And Romanization is the idea that the Romans were taking over these areas, making them provinces and forcing them to be as Roman as possible so that everyone walked the same, looked the same and spoke the same, did the same things. That's quite an outdated idea in, in scholarship now on many different subjects, uh, such as religion. But with gladiators, it's, it's proving a difficult kind of uh, myth to shake. And I don't think that the Romans are pushing this at all. Yes, Julius Caesar was the first one to take over amphitheatres, but the first person to put on games in Greece, uh, it was in Turkey, was a Greek king. And he put that on over a century before Julius Caesar even was born. Uh, he put on games about 50 years after the Punic Wars, and he'd been a hostage of Rome, had seen everything in Rome, and he'd gone back to Greece as a king in Antioch. And he said, you know what, I'm going to on a huge festival we're going to do all of our normal stuff there's going to be chariots and stuff like that but i, I want to show you guys the stuff that i've been uh, seeing over in rome and he put on more sets of gladiators than even the romans had put on in any one festival at that point so the very first gladiators in in the greek world were put on by greek king and there's there's further evidence that the the romans didn't really care what the Greeks did as long as they behaved and you know paid their money on time because otherwise you you would see very Roman buildings like amphitheatres and you'd, you'd see them forcing them to build them but also so as we said uh, the the games were part of the the role of the high priest of the imperial cult it was their job to provide something on behalf of the emperor for the people to glorify the empire and the emperor but they didn't have to put on gladiatorial games. They could put on a dramatic festival. They could put on chariot racing. They could put on an athletic festival. They're choosing to put on gladiatorial games. There's no one telling them to do that. They've got a list of choices and they're choosing which one they want that day. And uh, for instance, we've got a letter from Hadrian, the Emperor Hadrian, the city in Turkey, Aphrodisias, had written to him and said, look, look we really want to put on a gladiatorial show. And uh, they used to put them on in the stadium at Aphrodisias, and we've got a lot of uh, gladiatorial evidence from there, so we know that they really loved them. We really want to put on a gladiatorial show. But some people are saying that they might enjoy some fresh water every now and again, so build an aqueduct instead. But we really want the gladiators. What do you think we should do? And the Roman emperor is saying to these Greeks, are you insane? Build the aqueduct. It's a permanent thing that's going to help you every day for potentially centuries. That's the pragmatic thing to do. Ignore the gladiators, build the aqueduct. You can have gladiators next year if you really want them. So actually, we've got evidence of a Roman saying, don't put on a gladiatorial show. And, and the Greeks saying, but we really want to. <laughs> so I don't think this is Romans kind of pushing their culture on the Greeks. I think this is the Greeks living underneath the Romans, but seeing this cultural import that matches so many of their interests. And especially if we consider, for instance, comparing it to other places. In Palestine, Judea, King Herod, so the one who tried to kill the baby Jesus, that King Herod, he had also spent a lot of time uh, talking to Romans, visiting Rome. He loved all of that stuff. So he was already known as a huge builder. He loved building monuments and he built loads for different Roman type events, including gladiatorial combat. Some of them were hybrid, some of them were temporary, but he built areas for gladiators to, to perform. And what we see is, uh, a very uh, kind of concentrated period of gladiatorial combat in that area. But after he dies, nothing. Until 
a couple of centuries later, the uh, Judeans had an, yet another uprising against the Romans. It's the Bar Kokhba revolt. And the Romans responded by absolutely piling in as many of their legions as possible to babysit the local population. And that's when we see gladiatorial combat there really flourish. And it's not the locals going to see it at all. It's the legionaries and the, the merchants with their families that are going to see it. The Jewish population there refuse to go unless they know that one of the fighters is a fellow uh, Jew, so that they can be there to cheer them on and to witness their death as a martyr. But the Romans aren't, aren't forcing the population to go there either. They, they couldn't give a toss. They're going to put them on for their own benefit. And if, if the locals want to go, that's fine. But they're not going to make a fuss about it. So I think that's absolutely the same in the Greek world. The Romans aren't too fussed. If they like it, great. They enjoy it. We get to go and see it as well. But but if the local population don't show much interest, they're not going to force it. So I don't think this is Roman saying, look, we're here now. We're the boss. And this is how we're going to do things. I think this is the Greeks looking at something that matches their interests, that catches their eye and saying, yeah, OK, we, we'd like to do a bit of this too, please. Alexandra, I love this. This has been such a great podcast. Finally, we get to hear something rather than it's all about the Romans because it just it wasn't it wasn't all about the Romans and this has been really enlightening to learn a bit more about Greek gladiators god you've got to come back and do something else have you got any ideas that you'd like to come and do uh, yeah I've got a few ideas of a, a myth or two that I could possibly dispel for you perfect do you know what we'll get you back on because this has been great you've been awesome I know Beth has had a great time we've both had a great time so when is your first book going to come out about this Oh, well, I don't know. Talk to a publisher and, and give them my name. Uh, but yeah, I'm I'm constantly thinking about it and uh, I'd like to write as much as possible. So just waiting for an opportunity. Perfect. We'll get you back on. Thank you so much for joining us. And I'm really excited about next time. Yeah, see you then. Our incredible guests give us 45 minutes of their time to join us and talk about their work or their new book. This is just a small taster. As a result... We have launched our very own bookshop on bookshop.org, where you can find our guests' latest books, you can support them, and you can support us on History Hack. 10% of every sale via our bookshop supports the podcast and allows us to keep going and bring you more top-of-the-line guests. You can find our bookshop at bookshop.org forward slash shop forward slash history hack, or search for us in the shop section. Thank you so much for your continued support. We really appreciate our listeners and supporters. So make sure you get down to the bookshop and grab yourselves a new book.